Welcome and thank you. We are very grateful to you all for joining us here this evening and for being part of our community. My name is Elric Walker. I'm a board member of the Jung Association of Western Massachusetts. I'm so glad to be here with you for this, uh, this lecture tonight. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our uh, association. The Jung Association of Western Massachusetts is a mostly volunteer organization. We were founded in 1996, and we are concerned with promoting and exploring in community with others the ideas of the great depth psychologist, Carl Gustav Jung. I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce you to our board members and to thank them for their work on behalf of the association. Christine Olson is our president and our fearless leader. Penelope Tarasuk and Erica Lorenz are board members and advisors and two of the longest serving um, members of the board. Judy Hall is our bookkeeper. Judith, Judith Breyer is our secretary and is also helping with fundraising and hybrid tech. We welcome Dan Hathaway and Peter O'Brien as our newest board members. I serve as public relations liaison for the association. Many kind thanks to Andrew, who is here this, uh, this evening providing Zoom and technical assistance. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I want to give you some information about our upcoming lecture. There has been a change in the schedule um, uh, for March. This is for March 1st. Dr. Ed Tick has unfortunately had to postpone uh, his previously scheduled lecture on Poseidon due to unforeseen circumstances, but Ed will be uh, presenting, I believe, on Poseidon uh, in our next series. Uh, so on Friday, March the 1st, we will present The Way of the Wise Elder in Film, Exploring Conscious Aging Through the Mythic Power of Cinema with Terry Ebinger. Uh, Terry is a passionate film scholar and a retired psychotherapist with nearly four decades of experience as a depth psychological practitioner educator, dream consultant, spiritual director, multidisciplinary group leader. Um, I think this is going to be very interesting. So please join us on March 1st, Friday, seven o'clock uh, with Terry Ebinger. For more information about the Jung Association of Western Massachusetts and any information about upcoming lectures and events, please visit westmassjung.org. You will also find a wonderful video archive there that is rich with past lectures and events. So please go and explore those past lectures and events. Lots of good stuff there. Now, once upon a time before COVID changed the world, we used to meet in person and we often, after a lecture, would meet at a local restaurant for a salon of discussion um, in that same spirit, we have recently found rather organically that after a lecture, some folks enjoy staying a little later to have some continued discussion. So tonight, um, I would invite anyone who is interested to stay on a little bit after the lecture, after nine o'clock. Uh, please understand and uh, don't necessarily expect that our speaker will join us. She is invited. Um, but of course, she's going to be working hard through the evening. So um, uh, we'll see whether she would like to join us or not. Um, but Chris Olson and I will be available to stay for about 15 or 20 minutes um, after nine o'clock to facilitate any further discussion. And of course, I'd like to ask everyone to please understand we can't go real late. You know, we'll, we'll try to keep it at 15 or 20 minutes. Now, I am very excited about tonight's lecture. The lecture is titled Emily Dickinson and C.G. Jung, Soulmates, with Kay Lindauer. Kay Lindauer has um, had an interest in literature and psychology for the past 50 years. She's earned a divinity degree from a seminary in Rochester, New York, and she holds three degrees from Syracuse University. She's taught at the graduate level at Syracuse for 30 years 
and has taught adult education courses and coordinated conferences and retreats. For the past 30 years, she's taught day classes during the summer at the Chautauqua Institute in New York State. Dickinson's and Jung's writings on soul and dualities of the dualities of life have been a focused interest of Kay's. She has attended the New York Center for Jungian Studies Ireland programs over the years and has studied at the Jung Institute and at the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, Switzerland. So without further ado, um, please welcome Kay Lindauer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Good evening. Welcome. So for the past four weeks, I have been greeting people with the words, Happy New Year. But I guess that's time, it's just about time to let that salutation go, at least put it aside for the next 11 months. I do still have my Christmas tree up. I really want to show it to you. I'm just going to turn my computer for a moment so you can see the bright lights on my tree. That's uh, It's a live tree, and it hasn't started to shed yet. It's needles. So I'm quite excited to uh, still have that light up. Because as you can see out my windows, it's very dark, and it gets dark here in Syracuse, New York, you know, before 5 o'clock. And I really need to have those bright twinkling lights in my life. Um, my poinsettias are doing very well. Um, I'm going to have them at least for another week. Uh, and you all know that light and color makes a great difference, has a great impact on the psyche. So now during the first part of my presentation, I will be sharing a few of Dickinson's poems or excerpts from her poems and asking you to just focus on hearing the poems. Later, I will go to a screen share so that you can both hear and see the poems that I'm discussing. At the end of the program, I will list the first lines of each poem I discussed. All the poems are available to you online should you want to look them up. All you need to have is the first line. Emily didn't give any of her poems titles. So we just index them and search for them by that first line. So I will give a brief comment on a number of Dickinson's poems and point out parallels between her life, her work, and her mode of thought with that of Carl Jung's, while suggesting that many um, of their responses are so close to one another that I consider them soulmates. Although they lived uh, at different times and in different countries, Dickinson was born in 1830 and Carl Jung was born in 1875. Now, I am in a habit of calling Emily Dickinson Emily, and I call Carl Jung Jung. You know, today is February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day is always on February 2nd. United States and Canada, they don't agree on what day you should celebrate Thanksgiving. They have their own Thanksgivings, but they agree on Groundhog Day. On this day, news reporters watch for the groundhog, also known as the woodchuck, to emerge from his burrow. And whether he sees his shadow or not, is said to foretell the weather for the next six weeks. What makes February 2nd so significant is it is halfway between winter solstice and the spring equinox. February 2nd has traditionally been a date celebrated in many cultures and for many different regions, or many different reasons. I grew up in Northern Pennsylvania, down the road, you might say, from Punxsutawney, where the Groundhog Day tradition originated. It was a new version 
of an older European religious holiday called Candlemas. Uh, Candlemas celebrated the feast day of the uh, presentation of Jesus to the temple and, and Mary's purification rites. Now, in my childhood town, Groundhog Day was our holiday. We made bets and predictions on whether or not the groundhog hog would see his shadow. If the day was sunny, if the day was sunny, and the wood uh, the woodchuck or the groundhog saw his shadow, there would be six more weeks of weather with lots of snow yet to come. Now, if the day was cloudy and the groundhog didn't see his shadow, we kids thought we might just as well put our sleds back into the basement for winter was nearly over. At least we believed in this prediction for a day or two, though it has been less than 50% accurate over the years. Groundhog Day was first celebrated in 1887. That was one year after the death of Emily Dickinson. And it was the year that Carl Jung would become, have his 12th birthday. Now, as I said, February 1st is the date halfway between winter solstice and the spring equinox. It's called one of the four cross quarter days of the year. The others being Halloween, May Day, and August 1st, which is the traditional day, particularly in uh, Europe in the past, uh, where the heat, uh, where the wheat harvest would be celebrated. Now these days have a psychological significance. So what if we considered uh, February 2nd metaphorically as describing a psychological state of being. What would you be feeling like if you said, well, I'm having a February 2nd day? As many of you know, when one studies Jungian psychology, it's not long begin before you begin to see everything through this particular lens um, of looking at a, a literal situation and seeing it metaphorically. So considering the date, February 2nd, not literally, but rather occurring on an emotional calendar, one is somewhat in a dark place, yet the potential, yet the potential is present. It's that middle day, Groundhog Day. It's the day when uh, the potential is present for allowing more light to come forth, more consciousness to inform a given situation. This could be described as being in liminal space. It is also possible that this stage for uh, at this stage for one to remain in darkness or to regress back into the darkness after a very brief moment of light, rather than to remain living on earth. Now, we can think of the groundhog living under the earth, representing the life force in the unconscious that comes forth into consciousness on February 12th. Now, if the groundhog, as I said, sees his shadow, he will be, in other words, if there's light out, if the sun is shining, at that moment when he comes up out of his burrow and he sees his shadow, right, if he sees his shadow, he will go back into the darkness. If he sees his shadow, he returns to his burrow. If he doesn't see his shadow, he remains on the ground. Now you can make the metaphoric interpretations. It seems like a contradiction that if it is sunny, 
he will return to the darkness. If he has, being sunny, a moment of consciousness, he will return to the darkness. Perhaps at this crucial time, seeing one's shadow, now you're owning it metaphorically about your own February 2nd day of life, emotional life. Perhaps at this crucial time, seeing one's shadow may be too jarring, cannot be integrated into consciousness until later. Now, hopefully the regression back into the unconscious will be a creative one. Psychologically speaking, liminal space can be understood as a winter time of being. You know, it takes a lot of slow to grow. And there's moments of coming into consciousness and moments of regression. If the groundhog does not see his shadow, there will be an early spring. Consciousness will continue to increase as the days grow lighter and longer. So today in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, thousands of people gathered as they do every year when it was announced that yes, the groundhog had appeared early this morning, but had not seen his shadow. So, my friends, we can anticipate an early spring. And as I said, now if the sun is shining, the groundhog sees his shadow, we are assured of six weeks more of hard winter. Dickinson addresses such a psychological situation in her poem. There is a certain slant of light. And I think this is the ty uh, type of slant of life that sends the woodchuck back into the darkness. Dickinson writes, there is a certain slant of life, winter afternoons, that oppresses. There is a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses. And we can always associate light with consciousness. There's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tombs. Is a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us. Heavenly hurt it gives us. We can find no scar, but internal differences where the difference are. I'm sorry, where the meanings are internal differences where the meanings are. When we read the poem metaphorically, winter describes a time when we experience a metaphoric death. Something happens and life will never quite be the same again. After a certain age, we've all experienced a number of met metaphoric deaths. It's somewhat of a death of who we were, a death of our previous self-understanding. We all relate to the lines, internal differences, where the meanings are. One can come to appreciate Dickens, you know, phrase by phrase. You know, when people say to me that they have a hard time getting into Dickinson, Right? I always give them the same little piece of advice. Begin by making a list of the words and the phrases that speak to you. Come to her line by line. It's worth the effort. There's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. This seems to me perfectly to describe the Groundhog Day. When there is light, the shadow is seen, 
and it is oppressive. And so the days ahead will continue to be emotionally heavy, like cathedral tunes. Dickinson describes the feeling as heavenly hurt. Heavenly hurt, it gives us. We can find no scar, but internal differences where the meanings are. If the groundhog does not see his shadow, he can celebrate, um, we can celebrate in anticipation with Dickinson when she wrote, Dear March, come in. One is ready to welcome a change, a new season. Dear March, come in. How glad I am. I hoped for you before. Yes, I am sharing my own metaphoric interpretations. But you know, a poet lights but lamps. Themselves go out. And I appreciate a later stanza in this poem when the speaker wants to favor her time with March. Now thinking about March as a description of an emotional time in your life and wanting to savor being in March. And there's so much the speaker wants to talk over with March. She's not eager for April's arrival. She's too occupied. Now we can allow March to stand for this psychological state of being as part of the individuation process. As Dickinson wrote, who knocks? That April? Lock the door. I am occupied. You see, in the individuation process, right, uh, it has its own time schedule. April cannot push its way in. Or think of her line in another poem, spring is the period expressed from God. Spring is the period expressed from God. And you see that, that groundhog who, sees his, who doesn't see his shadows is the groundhog who's excited about the coming of spring. And spring is the period expressed from God. Among the other seasons, himself, God, himself, abide. Spring is the period expressed from God. Among the other seasons, himself, abide. Dickinson has God identifying with her in that God, too, endures and waits for spring. Now, her dates, Emily's dates are 1830 to 1886. So let's talk literally for just a moment. See, uh, imagine what winter would have been like for her at Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, when, uh, with no central heating in the house. Mm. We know from her letters how much she anticipated spring. Spring is the period expressed from God among the other seasons, himself abide. Now, Jung points out that in our lives, we, we encounter paradox over and over again. And it's paradox that we encounter in Emily's poetry. In these four lines, the poet recognizes that God is the one who brings spring. And yet, he also has to bide his time before doing so. God brings spring. Take us emotionally. He brings a springtime to your life. God brings spring. But God also must bide his time. Spring is the period expressed from God. Among the other seasons, himself abides. The next poem begins with the line, It was given to me by the gods. It was given to me by the gods. When I was a little girl, they give us presents most, you know, when we are new and small. 
So bringing yourself to the poem, what does it stand for, for you? It was given to me by the gods. In fact, when we get to questions and answers, I would love to have some of you share the little bit about your it. It was given to me by the gods. Jung felt that we were born with an archetypal makeup, with certain predispositions. Our task was to discover the life that we are meant to live. Rather than allowing our ego to determine the life it wished to live. In other words, the meaningful life was paying attention to what was given to us by the gods. Internal differences where the meanings are. I'm going to read the entire poem. It was given to me by the gods when I was a little girl. They give us presents most, you know, when we were new, small, I kept it in my hand. I never put it down. I did not dare to eat or sleep for fear it would be gone. I heard such words as rich. Now, take rich as metaphor. I heard such words as rich when hurrying to school from lips at corners of the street and wrestled with a smile. Now, I want you to imagine perhaps two school teachers standing on the corner, in the street corner, and they're talking with one another. And this little girl goes by, and they know this little girl. And they kind of point at her, and they say to one another, she's the gifted one. I heard such words as rich. They're saying to one another, she's rich. Metaphorically. She's bright. She's got talent. I heard such words as rich when hurrying to school from lips at corners of the street. <laughs> I wrestled with a smile. Rich, twas myself was rich to take the name of gold in gold to own in solid bars. The difference made me bold. Rich, twas myself was rich, to take the name of gold, and gold to own in solid bars, the difference made me bold. I suggest that Dickinson and Jung were strong, each strongly developed that which was given to them by the gods. If this had not been so, we wouldn't be having this program tonight. Jung and Emily were both highly intelligent, self-reliant. They trusted in their giftedness. And in the uh, words of Joseph Campbell, they followed their bliss, meaning their higher calling, their God-given vocations, rich, Twas myself was rich to take the name of gold, gold to own in solid bars. The difference made me bold. I suggest that these last four lines describe the self-understanding of both Dickinson and Jung. So what was given to each of us by the gods? Ask yourself, what was given to you by the gods? It's gold to own, your unique selves, your goldenness. Many of you are familiar with the books by Robert Johnson. Um, Robert Johnson was uh, in the first graduating class from the Jung Institute in Zurich, along with Helen Luke. And, you know, just as an aside, Joseph Campbell, who studied Jung, did not graduate from the Jung Institute in Zurich, but he did attend and he was a classmate of Robert Johnson's. And Robert Johnson has written so eloquently on the idea of finding the gold in your life, and particularly in his book entitled Inner Gold. It, it may be given to us as a child, most likely at conception, 
But it may take many years in order for us to own it. Go to own in solid bars. Mm -hmm. And that coming to own it would actually require going through the individuation process, possibly several times. Mm -hmm. Reflect on the poem. Where are you in this task of naming and owning the gold? Jung and Emily both broke from fundamental Christian tradition. Both forged their own religious path. Both were influenced by a wide range of reading. Both studied the Old and the New Testament. They knew these books very well and quoted from them liberally. Both contemplated their relationship to the divine all their lives, and they wrote about their experiences and their reflection, each in their own way. The next poem speaks, I think, for both Emily and Jung. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink or a chorister in an orchard or a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus, that loose-fitting white linen garment. Vestment. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a noted clergyman. His sermons are never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. See, Dickinson nourished her spirituality by being in nature. And in that respect, she mirrors the experiences of many people today. But during the 19th century, particularly at the Calvinistic Congregationalist Church in Amherst, there was a doctrine preached that said, no natural theology. God could be known only through the word, through scripture. Jung lived be, um, beside Lake Zurich. And for Jung, he nourished himself being alone on his sailboat and spending a time, spending time in his wilderness tower across the lake near the village of Bollingen. The Swiss Reformed Church of Jung's childhood was very similar to the Congregational Church in Emily's childhood. Now, in his book, Answer to Job, Jung writes about his childhood experiences of being in the cemetery where he witnessed burials. You see, his father was the local pastor. So I assume that this young boy, Jung as a young boy, was present at many burials that other children would not have been present at. But at these burials, this young boy, young boy Carl, he was told, you know, something that disturbed him very much. He was told that Jesus had taken the person back to himself. The reason the person had died is that Jesus had taken him back. According to his prayers that he had been taught to say at bedtime, Jesus was his protector, a comforting, benevolent presence. And young Carl just could not reconcile the two experiences, Jesus being a protector and Jesus causing death. Then there was the disappointment at his confirmation. He felt the failure of the confirmation experience, um, the experience to affect him. He, and he wondered if it was his fault. And for him, his confirmation was a failed experience. 
he had so hoped, see, that at this time he would have experienced a certain illumination. And he's standing up there at the altar being confirmed, and he is totally expecting something to happen, some illumination to come to him, and nothing happened. He felt that God had been absent at his, at his confirmation. God was for him from this time on, no longer present in the church. And as with Emily's father, Jung's father no longer insisted that Jung attend church. And it really surprises me that Edward Dickinson uh, did not insist on Emily going to church when she announced in her early 20s that she was no longer going to be in attendance. And Emily Dickinson's father, the local attorney, the, uh, the, the squire of Amherst, mm, was very concerned with social position. And, and the people in the Congregationalist Church, where well, they prayed for Emily since she didn't attend. Mm. They were concerned about her soul. And yet Edward Dickinson allowed Emily to stay at home. And I, and I often wondered with both Emily's father and Carl's father, if, if in fact uh, Emily and Carl were, were not living out their father's unconscious wishes that they too could stay home. You know, Jung wrote in Memory, Streams, and Reflection, my sense of union with the church and with the human soul, he's talking about his confirmation, so far as I knew it, was shattered. Let me read that again. I'm quoting from Memory, Streams, and Reflections. My sense of union with the church and with the human world, so far as I knew it, was shattered. I think it's really quite interesting here. He was equating uh, the, his union with the church with his, hu his connection to the human world. So if he lost his felt connection to the church, he equally lost his feeling of connection with the world, with, with humanity at large. And he goes on to say, I had not... It, so it seemed to me, suffered, I'm sorry, let me start it again. I had, so it seemed to me, suffered the greatest defeat of my life. The religious outlook, which I imagine constituted my sole meaningful relationship in the universe, my religious outlook, which I imagined constituted my sole meaningful relationship with the universe had disintegrated. I could no longer participate in general faith. He felt like an outsider until he really, all, all the, from his confirmation time until he entered the university. But like Emily, he never lost interest in God. He turned to books in an effort to know what God was all about, but philosophy. But over time, it was due to his own reflections that Jung came to understand the divine presence was within the psyche. Now, unlike Dickinson, Jung did have a church funeral where the minister remarked that Jung's great question had urged him through life. His great question. This great question was the one asked in Psalm 8. What is mankind that God should be mindful of him? At Dickinson's funeral, which was in her home, not a church funeral. Her friend, the very well-known literary critic of the day, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, recited the poem, No Coward Soul Is Mine, by 
by Emily Bronte. No coward soul is mine. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world's storm-tossed sphere. I see heaven's glories shine, and faith shines equal, arming me with faith. O oh God within my breast. You see, here we have Emily Bronte speaking like a Jungian. O oh God within my breast, almighty ever-present deity. Life that in me hath rest, as I undying life have power in thee. The poem ends with the line, and what thou art may never be destroyed. God is within me, says the poet, and what God is cannot be destroyed. I trust the poem would have pleased Emily very much and, and served as, as a fitting conclusion to all the years that she wrestled with God. One other comment concerning Jung and church. Although he did not attend church himself, he felt it was very important for his children to attend church. And after he built his home in Kusnak, uh, he designed the home and had it built. Uh, it's a village outside of Zurich. He also purchased a home just two blocks away for his widowed mother and unmarried sister because he wanted the mother, his mother, the grandmother, to be responsible for taking his five children, the grandchildren, to church. So although Jung didn't attend church, he insisted that his mother take his children to church. And I often wondered about that. Were the children living out a church-going experience that unconsciously Jung missed? Perhaps. Kenneth began one poem with the lines, the Bible is an antique volume. It's written by faded men. Yet both she and Jung studied the Bible all of their lives. Did she have opposing feelings about the Bible? I think perhaps she simply held the tension of the opposites, of her being attracted to it and being annoyed by it at the same time. The Bible is an antique volume written by faded men at the suggestion of holy specters. Subjects, Bethlehem. Eden, the ancient homestead. Satan, the brigadier. I love her use of the word brigadier, you see, uh, it, it, particularly in, in the British Army. Uh, a brigadier has a lot of power, but he's below the major. We could think of God as the major and Satan as the brigadier. Judas, the great defender. I'm sorry, the great defaulter. Judas, the great defaulter. David the troubadour. Sin, a distinguished precipice others must resist. Sin, a distinguished precipice cliff. You must not fall off it. A distinguished precipice. Others, others must resist. Emily didn't resist it. Mm -hmm. No, Emily, she didn't resist the dark side of herself. She brought it forth and she wrote about it. If the people in Amherst mm -hmm. had known about and read Emily Dickinson's poetry, they would have found much of it blasphemous, hmm. sinful. And I love, Emily writes, sin, a distinguished precedence others must resist. Boys that believe are very lonesome. Other boys are lost. Had but the tale a warbling teller, all the boys would come. 
Orpheus's sermon captivated. It did not condemn. I'm most interested in those last two lines. Dickinson, like Jung, very steeped in mythology and frequently made mythological references. Orpheus's sermon captivated. It did not condemn. Well, the question that comes to my mind is, what was Orpheus's sermon about? Was it about love? Was it about his love for Eurydice? Was it about his journey to the underworld? Was it that Orpheus's sermon was poetic, symbolic, and thus allowing the listener to bring themselves to the sermon, and in so doing, bringing them bringing themselves to themselves. We can imagine Orpheus' sermon at least not being about judgment. Dickinson assures us of that. So what did Jung say about the Bible? He said, we must read the Bible or we shall not understand psychology. Our psychology, whole lives, our language and imagery are built upon the Bible. To the extent that Bible stories and images are archetypal, they are just as relevant today as through the past generations. I might add that Dickinson's favorite book in the Bible was Revelations, and her favorite chapter in Revelations was 21, chapter 21. It tells about the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, it's also archetypal. And what is lost? What is lost in terms of our self-understanding when we no longer hear the archetypal stories? Archetypal stories connect us to ourselves. What is lost in terms of our self-understanding, when we are no longer hearing the archetypal stories. These stories are like rituals. They nourish a secret part of ourselves. Jung asked the important questions. Where shall we find the risen Christ today? His answer. Hopefully some of you know it. The answer he gave to his own question was, it had to be found in psychology. Where do we find the risen Christ today? In psychology. He believed metaphorically in the Christian story. Now Dickinson, at times, rewrote scripture. You may recall the story of Jacob, wrestling with the angel. And when uh, Dickinson uh, retold that story in a poem, it's called the poem is called A Little East of Eden. And when Dickinson retells that biblical story in a poem, she has Jacob blessing the angel rather than the angel blessing Jacob. So, so her Jacob says to the angel, I will not let you go until I bless thee. For Emily, the victorious Jacob, proudly reserves even the power of blessing to himself. And Emily identified with Jacob. It seems to me that Emily's lines are such an affirmation in advance of Jung's writing. Mm -hmm of the continuous interaction, the continuous influence between the ego and the divine. The ego must always bless the transcendent presence. The ego, conscious ego, must bless the transcendent presence, which is done through the individuation process, bringing unconscious material 
into consciousness, which is always a sacred experience. Which, by the way, is exactly what Emily's version of Jacob wrestling with the angel story is saying. It's all about the manifestation of the angelic power and presence being known in consciousness. Of course, Dickinson didn't have the Jungian vocabulary. She didn't speak of the individuation process. But she did have an extremely perceptive understanding of many core ideas further developed by Jung. You see, Jung gave us a vocabulary for an understanding of the psyche that many people, many great thinkers before him had, including him. Of course, Jacob may have been speaking of the divine presence within himself. Emily, now Emily was influenced by Emerson. Emily was influenced by Emerson and the contemporaries, contemporary to her, uh, tran transcendental, the transcendentalist in their movement, which this transcendentalist club, as it was, you know, recognized the God presence within a person. Emerson and the transcendentalists recognized the God presence within a person. Emily read Emerson. It's quite possible that Emily's sense of the divine presence within was influenced by Emerson's writing. Now, we don't know that Jung ever read Emerson, but we do know that Emerson's work had been translated into German and were and he, uh, the Emerson's writings were very popular in Germany at the time when when Jung was reading Nietzsche and Kant and other philosophers. We know that Nietzsche was very influenced by Emerson, and it's quite likely, it's quite likely that Jung and his idea of the presence within was also influenced by Emerson's work. Now I'm going to uh, go to the PowerPoint. And uh, from now on, you'll be able to follow along with the poems that I share. Um, I can take just a moment, though, in this transition time. Why don't we take two comments? And I am just going uh, uh, to... You want to raise your hand and maybe uh, you'll be called on? Or... Nick, could we have two comments? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Um, the poem that you read that has the, the gold image of the gold bars. Yes. That's. Uh, I'm curious how old she was when she wrote that. It sounds to me like someone with a very well-developed uh, sense of sense uh of the Okay, we none of her poems are dated. Oh, okay. so um, what what has been done with her poems is that her handwriting has been studied. Based on her handwriting, um, and this is uh, post nineteen fifty five, uh, and actually is in the nineteen seventies, and we've actually had the first really accurately done book. It's by uh, the collected poems by Franklin where her poems have been put in what we believe to be a chronological order. Uh, and that's, like I said, based on the, the way her handwriting changed over time. And then the poems have been given numbers. So this particular poem, it was given to me by the gods, is poem number uh, 455, out of 1,800 poems. Now, most of the poems that begin in this book, with just a few exceptions, were not written until she was at least 28 and 30. Those are the num those are the poems that would be like number 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. So now we're up to 455. 
So I, I can't say exactly how old she would have been, but probably maybe 33 or 34, something like that. I guess my main comment is how self-assured she is uh, describing herself with those images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's something to do with genius, too. Genius knows itself. Mm. But then we all have some genius within us. Let's have one other comment. Thank you, Christine. May I have one other comment, please? Well, are you taking anything from what's being said? No comments? Okay. Sure. All right. All right, then I will go to my PowerPoint. Are, are you all doing okay? Mm? Mm? Okay. Okay. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just see. A, 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 this is the only picture that we have of Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. uh, done when she was at Mount Holyoke. Mm -hmm. She was there for one year. It was a seminary uh, for women at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the purpose there was to... Uh, reinforce the young women's Christianity so that they would raise um, children who were strongly Christian or, or become missionaries. Um, quite love this picture. Uh, now here's Emily. As she appeared, uh, none of her poems, there were a couple that were kind of hijacked and put in a newspaper before she uh, while she was living. Uh, otherwise, selected poems were edited and published after her death. And um, uh, the publisher didn't feel that um, the, the picture of Emily that you just saw would sell many books. And so this, only, this is the only picture, authentic picture that we have of her. So this picture was sent to um, a, an artist in Boston who painted miniatures and that picture was taken and that face, that same image was given a new hairdo and a new wardrobe. And that same face was uh, on several occasions was given different hairdos and different wardrobes, but it's the one photograph. And here we have Jung, uh, probably in his, around his uh, late thirties. And here we have the postage stamp that came out in 1971 of you, of, of Emily. Uh, it was an eight cent stamp. I can't, we can't buy many eight cent stamps anymore. Uh, and uh, I, I like the sketch of, of uh, Jung. You know, a photograph takes a literal image, but a sketch or a portrait um, is a deeper expression. It expresses the artist's understanding of the essence of a person. Okay. I'm going to stay, I'm going to go back. I'm going to stay there for a moment. Both Jung and Emily contemplated the relationship between consciousness, the soul, and God. Jung had great Respect for mystery, that's mystery with a capital M. And he accepted that much was unknowable. I'm sure Emily would have agreed, but that did not stop either of them from writing on the topics. One can dissect the human brain. You can dissect the human brain. You can find personality. I'm sorry, you cannot find personality. You cannot find the archetypes. You can't find soul or morality or character or memories. Hmm? Oh, memories are a great example here. Just where are they stored? Huh? 
Or you can say, well, memories are housed in the personal unconscious. Hmm. But just where is the personal unconscious to be found? Yes, according to Jung's hypothetical model, the memories are right under the waterline in Freud's iceberg. And yes, Freud was the first to use the iceberg image. But when we dissect the brain, we don't find the iceberg. Nevertheless, despite the impossibility of fully understanding the psyche and the human condition, great thinkers, including Dickinson and Jung, explored in their writing the relationship between consciousness and nature and the relationship between thinking and God. In his book, The Undiscovered Self, Jung states, the structure and the physiology of the brain furnishes no explanation of the psyche. I read that again. The structure and the physiology of the brain furnishes no explanation of the psyche. That is not to say that the brain isn't involved in some unconscious processes and that a damaged brain doesn't affect personality. In volume two of his letters, Jung speaks of the brain as a transformer station. Interesting. Speaks of the brain as a transformer station. An idea that Deepak Chopra later developed. And in 1925, in a lecture, Jung reminded participants that our thoughts do not literally walk around inside our brains. To some degree, we can study how psychological issues express themselves in measurable ways through the nervous system. But still, mystery rules. And we know that uh, Jung did a great deal of work um, with um, the light, uh, what became the lie detectors test, and uh, also asking questions and and uh, measuring one's um, nervous neurological responses. And he found that in this way, in his word as these word association experiments, that he could identify the complexes that people suffered from. Now, as I already said, despite the impossibility of fully understanding the psyche and the human condition, great thinkers, including Dickinson and Jung, explored in their writings the relationship between consciousness and nature or between consciousness and the unconscious. Dickinson didn't use that language or the relationship between thinking and God. Unfortunately, there's only time to give you a few examples of this, but um, these explorations occupied uh, Emily's entire adult life as well as Jung's adult life. I want us to look at Emily's famous poem about the brain. Although it is difficult, to say exactly what she is referring to when she uses the word brain, she is probably referring to conscious thinking. Dickinson is the mistress of metaphor, and she does not usually speak of word meaning a literal interpretation. All right, so now we can, the brain, It doesn't have a title. It's known as the brain is wider than the sky. The brain is wider than the sky. And if you're not familiar with Dickinson's poetry, I assume some of you are and some of you may not be. Um, She used her own 
capitalization as she chose to do so. She um, put in her dashes wherever she wished, and she did not um, adhere to any formal way of writing poetry that was accepted in her day. In her day. Um, today, uh, she's more popular than ever because her freelance style uh, is very acceptable, but it would not have been acceptable in her day. So that when her poems were first published after her death, shortly after her death, um, they were severely uh, edited. The capitalization was taken out, the dashes were taken out, um, they were made to many times rhyme more carefully. Um, periods were put at the end of the of the stanzas, etc. And like I said, we did not. Well, Nineteen fifty five was the first time that we had any of Dickinson's poems that came directly based directly on her manuscripts. Uh, no one. Um, these manuscripts were privately owned and no one got to see them. And so we only had the severely edited edition. Then we had the first um, book coming out by a man named Johnson in 55. That's the first time that we actually had the opportunity to read a Dickinson poem as it was written. So she's just newly available to us. And then in the 1990s, when we have a more exact um, collection of her complete works. Again, I want to give you that name. It's Franklin. So if you're going to read Dickinson, I urge you to read from the Franklin collection. You know, it, it just boggles my mind that you see calendars and, and note cards and various things. With a, with a verse by Emily Dickinson on, and they're using one of these um, uh, edited versions rather than an authentic um, stanza from a Dickinson poem. So the brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one the other will contain with ease and you beside. One more time. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. So the brain can, can contain the sky. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue. The one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. The brain is deeper than the sea. For hold them blue to blue. The one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. Now here the brain is compared with a sponge. The brain can absorb the sea. Now the, let's look at these two stands, first two stanzas together. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. The brain is just, the brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue for blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. Now the last stanza. It, um, you see, the first two stanzas, Dickinson seems to be asking if external reality only exists in the mind. In these first two stanzas, she's asking if external reality only exists in the mind. Now, in this next stanza, she writes, the brain is wider than the sky. I'm sorry. No. Sorry, just a moment. The brain is just the weight of God. For heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. The brain is just the weight of God. For 
heft them pound for pound. They will differ if they do a syllable from sound. Now, Dickinson, oh, we guess we can stay on there for a moment. Dickinson says that God and the brain are equal in weight, pound for pound. Now, we are going not going to put God on a scale. So, so what comes to your mind in, the, in response to the phrase, the weight of God? What does that phrase mean to you, the weight of God? Studying a Dickinson poem requires a, a line-by-line line unpacking. Unfortunately, it is out of the bounds of this talk to explore the poem that I'm presenting in detail. However, it is fascinating uh, uh, to study these poems. I hope you do it all the rest of your life. And, and if you haven't been studying Dickinson, I hope I'm wetting your interest in Dickinson. So there are many excellent commentaries on Dickinson's 1,800 poems. For example, there's a book by Helen Ventler. The book is entitled Dickinson. Selected Poems and Commentaries. Highly recommend it. Dickinson, Selected Poems and Commentaries by a woman called Helen Ventler, uh, a woman from Harvard. Um, and in that book, she discusses many selections from the complete works. So including the poem, The Brain is Wider Than the Sky suggesting that in this poem, God, through nature, utters in unintelligible sounds, that God makes unintelligible sounds, and that the human language associated with the brain, that the brain alone speaks in intelligible syllables that God speaks in sound, but the brain has language, can speak in syllables, syllables forming words. Therefore, the brain is superior to God. Hmm? Symbols superior to sound. Or divinity is exceeded in power by humanity. This makes language superior to God. Now, I already mentioned Dickinson's writing about Jacob wrestling with the angel. Remember that wrestling match we just talked about? You would not let God, he would not let God's representative go until he, Jacob, gave the blessing. So a common theme in Dickinson's poetry is the extraordinary position played by the human mind, by the human being. There are many approaches to, to discussing each of Emily's poems, multiple understandings. Um, setting Wendler aside for a contrasting understanding, I want to refer to a moment uh, about a commentary on this poem by uh, Charles R. Anderson, who wrote that, the poem is about the mind's perception of reality. Anderson says that perhaps the value of the poem is not to minimize the importance of God, but rather to magnify the importance of consciousness. God being associated with sound. Syllables and language thus consciousness. Dickinson was asking some really big questions concerning what it means to be human. Questions that have not been asked in her particular way before. She asks questions that had not been asked in her particular way before. In this regard, I see her work as a forerunner to Jungian psychology. In this next poem, um, it mirrors what Jung discussed in hundreds of pages 
So this one poem that we're going to look at next, that Dickinson discusses in a few lines, M, er, Jung discussed the same idea, but it took him hundreds of pages of writings to do so. You know, we need both of the writers. And I suggest that reading both of them, each enriches the other. So here's Jungian psychology put in the words of Emily Dickinson. One need not be a chamber to be haunted. One need not be a chamber to be haunted. One need not be a house. The brain has quarters surpassing material place. One need not be a chamber to be haunted. One need not be a house. The brain has quarters surpassing material place. Far safer on a midnight meeting external ghost than its interior confronting that cooler host. The inner go, the inner ghost, that cooler ghost, far safer of a midnight meeting, external ghost than its interior confronting that cooler host. And you know about this. This is the dark night of the soul. This is the three a.m. that ghost you encounter. Ourselves be oh um. I think, I'm sorry, I think I am missing a slide. Let me read the, the next verse. Far safer through an, ad, an abbey gallop, a stone to chase, than unarmed one self-encounter in lonesome place. Let me read it again. Far safer through an abbey's gallop, the stone's a chase, than unarmed one self-encounter in lonesome place place. Think about meeting that inner ghost unarmed. And and what kind of armor would you have to order to safely meet the inner ghost? Hmm. And then the poem concludes, our self behind our self concealed should startle most our self behind our self concealed should startle most. You know, I think about that in terms of persona. If one could see oneself behind one's persona, hmm, would startle most. So many people begin to believe that they they are their persona. It seems to me that Emily has put into poetic expression the emotional difficulty and the scariness of self-confrontation, which from a Jungian perspective is required for the individuation process. The individuation process, meaning psychological growth and development, is dependent on encountering the inner ghosts. The psychological work to be done is all about self-confrontation, our self behind ourself. What Jungians often refer to as the other. Emily calls that cooler host. Let's go back to that. Now here we are. Far safer of a midnight meeting, external ghost, than its interior confronting that cooler host. Now, Jung would refer to the cooler host as the other. And it's interesting that we that Dickinson would call the cool the other that cooler host. She she's using this metaphoric image that we would find in a, in a gothic novel where the protagonist is, is being pursued by some unknown power. And indeed, self-confrontation 
is a lonesome experience. Jungian scholar James Hollis writes about interior ghosts in his book, Hauntings. Hope some of you might uh, read James Hillman. If you're looking for uh, books about Jungian psychology that are very accurate in terms of uh, following through with Jung's core beliefs uh, and are very readable. Jung himself is not always that readable. Uh, I highly recommend all of the books by James Hillman. And this book, Hauntings, are about the inner ghosts that we have to confront. And in that book, Hollis begins by quoting Ibsen, uh, you know, the playwright Ibsen wrote The Doll's House, etc., uh, from Ibsen's play, Ghosts. And I'm going to read that uh, opening lines from Ibsen's play. But I'm inclined to think we're all ghosts. It's not only the things that we've inherited from our fathers and mothers that live on in us. It's not only the things that we've inherited from our fathers and mothers that live on in us, but all sorts of old dead ideas and old dead beliefs and things like that. They're not actually alive in us, but they're rooted there all the same. And we can't rid ourselves of them. And we are, all of us, so painfully afraid of the light. We are, all of us, so painfully afraid of the light. Painfully afraid of bringing our inner ghosts into consciousness. So 50 to 70 years after Dickinson wrote this poem, Jung went on to write at great length about multiple selves that live within us, both in our consciousness and within our unconscious. We are a, a collage of multiple selves. The next point is on the same theme that which includes the internal hosts. Only now there are many hosts, many ghosts, and Dickinson writes. Alone I cannot be. Alone I cannot be. For hosts do visit me. Regardless, a recordless company who baffle key. Alone I cannot be. For hosts do visit me. Recordless company who baffle key. We're talking about those inner ghosts. They have no robes nor names, nor almanacs, nor climbs, but general homes, like gnomes. Their coming may be known. Oh, yeah. yeah. Their coming may be known by courtiers within. Their going is not, for they are never gone. One more time. Alone I cannot be, for hosts do visit me, recordless company who baffle key. They have no robes, nor names, no almanacs, nor climbs, but general homes, like gnomes. Their coming may be known by courtiers within. Their going is not, for they are never gone. The word hosts. Alone I cannot be, for hosts do visit me. The word host is defined as a person who receives or entertains other people as guests. The host is the one who receives and entertains others as guests. As so often, Dickinson juxtaposition ideas 
in here, the hosts are the visitors. Hmm? The ghosts within you hmm, visit you. Do the hosts come from the dream realm? If so, Dickinson says that these hosts are often part of us and not just when we get a glimpse of them or whatever issue they personified in our dreams. They're always with us. I think of Hermes, the messenger of the gods, as the head courtier. The, these hosts, being like gnomes, come from a mythic place, or we could say from the archetypal realm. As Jung said in the Red Book, we all live in our dreams. We live in our dreams. And our dreams are filled with hosts. We can all immediately identify the first line of the poem. Alone I, can, um, I cannot be for a host to visit me. I want to move on now to the poem, Me from Myself to Banish. Give me a moment. And just pause for a moment to say, I hope that this is meaningful to you. I certainly enjoy an opportunity to share my work. So we can all immediately identify with this line, me from myself to banish, mm -hmm. uh, just as we could the other poems. We all have multiple techniques for trying to escape ourselves. And as Jungians, we are well aware of the trouble that trying to escape ourselves can bring. Although we are probably more apt to readily identify how others are trying to avoid dealing with themselves than we are to recognize our own behaviors. Needless to say, the poem is what depth psychology is all about. The poem acknowledges the complexity of the human being and the difficulty confronting one's inner conflicts. Me from myself to banish. Had I art, invincible my fortress unto all heart. Me from myself to banish. Had I art, you don't have the ability to do it. Me from myself to banish. Had I art, well, you don't have that art. Invincible my fortress unto all heart. But since myself assault me, how have I peace? But since myself assault me, how have I peace? Except by subjugating consciousness, subjugating, uh, enslaving consciousness, conquering consciousness, overpowering consciousness. Whatever that is all about is an impossible task. But since myself assault me, how have I peace except by subjugating consciousness? And since we're mutual monarch, how this be? Except by abdication, me of me? Now, note the word monarch. It's singular. Hmm. Me and myself are two aspects of a single monarch, which, of course, Mm. renouncing ourselves is impossible, except by abdicating me of me, impossible. Mm. Union psychology is all about um, uh, the complexes that we get into, the problems that we have in our attempt to abdicate me for me. We have all kinds of defense mechanisms that we that we use to to try to do so. Personally, I'm drawn to this poem because the speaker, and one can't really separate Emily from the poetry, 
I think the speaker here is really yearning for wholeness, for oneness, wishes she could bring uh, the different parts of herself together. Mm. Jung said in memory streams and reflections, I have had much trouble getting along with my ideas. And that's the fight within himself between, you know, him, him, he and himself. Mm -hmm. I've had much trouble getting along with my ideas. One part of himself believed one way, but another part of him of himself believed another way. But I think this is also um, obvious, for example, with the argument that he made with all these arguments that he makes with Philemon in the Red Book. Some of you might be familiar with the Red Book. And there he is recording arguments that he has with himself. But he has formed in his dream world an image of this other. So there's me and myself. And so for the myself part, he has an image and he names, he names that other part of himself personifies it, gives it the name Philemon. And then he has arguments with Philemon and he writes them all out. And then he copied those arguments down in beautiful calligraphy. And that's what makes up the Red Book. The arguments that, that Jung is having with himself. And since we're mutual monarch, how this be except the abdication? me of me. Of course, you could be like Jung and try to write out those arguments be between the different parts of yourself. And in, and in time, I think Jung came to a, a certain wholeness, not totally, a certain wholeness through that process. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about love. After all, <laughs> it's only 12 days until Valentine's. In his writing about love and memory streams and reflections, Jung quotes 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love beareth all things and endures all things. And in his commentary on this passage, Jung said that these words, love bears all things and endures all things, says all there needs to be said about love. Love for Jung is something superior to the individual. Love for Jung is something superior to the individual. And that man is dependent upon love, is sustained by love. Jung goes on to say that if man possesses a grain of wisdom, if man possesses a grain of wisdom, he will lay down his arms and name love by the name of God. God is love, and love is God. By affirming that humans have free will, Jung said that man has the freedom to choose between truth and error. He doesn't say that man can choose between love and hate. <clears throat> he defines the choice as being between truth and error. So, in the following Dickinson poem, the speaker chooses truth over error, which from a Jungian perspective is about what love is about. I really appreciate Jung's definition of love as truth. Jung is defining love as truth. I'm not so sure how I feel about his use of the word error as the opposite of truth. It sounds to me a bit like saying one missed the mark, but an unloving response, an unloving response is much more than missing the mark. The language Dickinson chooses for this dichotomy is that of love and hate. I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me. And life was not so ample I could finish enmity. 
I have no time to hate because the grave would hinder me and life was not so ample I could finish enmity. You won't live long enough to finish your hating. Nor had I time to love. You're not going to live long enough to finish your loving either. Nor had I time to love. But since some industry must be, the little toil of love I thought be large enough for me. Nor had I time to love. But since some industry must be, the little toil of love I thought be large enough for me. I like the expression, the toil of love. It's not always easy. A little toil of love, it endures all things. Mm -hmm. And I like Jung's equating it with truth. In Buddhism, it relates hatred to a kind of poison. And in another poem, Emily equates love with immortality. Unable are the love to die. Unable are the love to die, for love is immortality. Nay, it is deity. Unable are the loved to die. Unable are the loved to die. Many of you have lost loved ones. Unable are the loved to die, for love is immortality. Nay, it is deity. Mm. As Jung said, we should not pretend to understand the world only by the intellect. The judgment of the intellect is only part of the truth. The judgment of the intellect is only part of the truth. Unable are the love to die, for love is immortality. Nay, it is deity. Unable, um, unable they that love. Unable they that love to die. For love reforms vitality into divinity. Unable are uh, Unable they that love to die, for love reforms vitality into divinity. So, unable are the love to die, for love is immortality. Nay, it's deity. Emily tells us that love is deity, or we could say love is divine. Perhaps some of you were taught as a child uh, a definition, God is love. The poem that goes on, unable are the love to die, unable they that love to die, for love reforms vitality into divinity. In this poem, Dickinson is equating immortality with both being loved and loving, equating immortality with both being loved and loving. Emily is suggesting that love is a spiritual power, that love is a spiritual power in the likeness of God. Jung reminds us the memory streams and reflections in, in a classical time when such things as love were probably, properly understood hmm, to be the result of being recognized by Eros, or the god of love. Eros, whose divinity transcends our human limits. Indeed, mystery, mystery, and love are connected. And both Emily and Jung believed in mystery. Emily's love uh, the love of her life. Uh, just one second. Um, I'm 
I'm going to stop screen share and come back to talk a little bit about their love. Um, okay. Um, Emily's love of her life seems to have become very late, not until she was like 50. She died at 55. So around 50, she fell very much in love uh, with a man named Judge Lord from Salem, Massachusetts. He had been a friend of Emily's father, was around her father's age. And now, one wonders what that was all about. I think um, it would be an interesting analysis, indeed, of her great love for Judge Lord. And wrote very, I have to tell you people, she wrote very sexy letters to Judge Lord. And we look at Emily Dickinson and we think, what? Mm, we have the letters. So those of us who know about Jung's love for several women mm, uh, have especially strong emotional responses to it. Um, particularly to that long-term affair that he had with Tony Wolf. Emma Young, his wife, suffered a great deal. The new book that's come out called Reflections on the Life and Dreams of C.J. Young. Now, um, I assume that most of you, being interested in Jungian psychology, are familiar with the book Memory, Streams, and Reflections. But at the time that book was published, there was a lot of the material that was left out. A lot of it was left out because the family demanded it be left out. And this new book has just come out. Is uh, not all, but a lot of the material that had been edited out of memory streams and reflections. And this new book is called Reflections on the Life and Dreams of C.J. Jung. Uh, by... Uh, J Jaffrey, even though she's been dead for many years, the book was never published. She's the same one that worked with Jung in writing Memory, Streams, and Reflections. All right. And it contains passages, like I said, that were reheld, particularly some passages concerning his affair with Tony Wolf. Now, and not all of those passages that, that uh, uh are even in this book because the family simply would not allow them to be included. Excuse me, Kay, you asked for a time mark yes, and did. we're at that point. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. I'll read an excerpt from the passage uh, from that book that Jung wrote on Tony Wolf. Um, he shared this information uh, in 1958, just a couple years before he died. And he said about his relationship and about this affair, there are things in life which herald a stroke of fate. There are things in life which herald a stroke of fate. I know this, and I knew this the moment I was confronted with the problem of Tony Wolf. There are things in life which herald a stroke of fate. I knew this the moment I was confronted with the problem of Tony Wolf. But the affair began, and Jung related that he had several dreams about her. Mm -hmm. um, there was a period of time when he was fighting the idea that he wanted this love relationship with her, he, that he was yearning for intimacy with Tony Wolf, despite his marriage. And he loved his wife. And he never left his wife for her. He was continued all of his life to be married. It was like he had two wives. That's what of what it was like. And but before he gave in to his desires, uh, he he was plagued by these dreams about her. And he felt that that was a message from that fate was telling him that he was. Well, this affair was faded and that he couldn't do anything about it. In one dream, he saw a woman whose body from the middle down uh, was stone. 
this image of a woman came to him in his dream. And from the, the waist down, she was stone. And in his dream, Jung knew that he had given this woman an injection that had paralyzed her. And we can think of that as an emotional injection that had paralyzed her. And he felt wracked with guilt. Not long after that, he had a real life experience. Now, Jung was very open to these things, like having a dream and then having, then equating it with a real life experience that would follow it. Many of us don't give our dreams enough attention to be able then to see the, the relationship between something that might happen shortly after. But, but Jung had the awareness. And he said, not long after he had a dream, and or, I'm sorry, not long after he had a real life experience, and he was out in the middle uh, of Lake Zurich by himself swimming. He was a great swimmer. But all of a sudden, he had a cramp in his leg. And he said uh, that, he, that he made a vow at that moment that if the cramp went away, and he was able to swim safely to shore, he would have the affair with Tony Wolf. Well, um, in a few moments, the cramp in his leg went away. He swam to shore. He contacted Tony Wolf, and he began this intimate affair. Jung said of it, I knew that it was inevitable. It was a decision of life or death. Well, so much for um, Carl Jung's love life. Um, I want to go back to screen share now for just a second. <clears throat> now I don't know which to go back to here. Okay, because I have a listing. I'm not able to move this. Um, Mm. Let me see. I want to show you the list of titles that um, we have gone over. Should you want to write the, the first lines down again? Let me see if I go to a different one. Oh, dear. Okay. Just have to find it again. Excuse me. Here it is. There it is. Here's the poems that we've covered tonight. There's a certain slant of light. Dear March, come in. Spring is the period. It was given to me by the gods. Some keep the Sabbath. The bride is uh, the Bible is an antique volume. The brain is wider than the sky. One need not be a chamber to be haunted. Alone I cannot be. Me from myself to banish. I had no time to hate. And unable are the loves to die. Okay. Um, I'll conclude with this poem. Lads of Athens. That's all of you. Lads of Athens. Faithful be. Lads of Athens, faithful be to thyself. And mystery, and all the rest is perjury. Lads of Athens, faithful be to thyself and mystery, and all the rest is perjury. Dickinson knew that truth or essence lies beyond human understanding. One must be faithful to mystery while coming to know one's own truth as much as possible. Well, thank you very much. Now we have uh, a few minutes left, and I hope that you might have a few responses. Go ahead, Elric. Wow. Okay. All I can say is, wow, you, uh, you, you covered 
in, in this last part of the talk so much. I mean, we could have stopped in any small space and gone everywhere. <laughs> but some thoughts. Um, one thought is that I cannot remember exactly where it is or how to quote it, but Jung um, did, in one of his volumes, speak about... Um, his idea, and he did it with apologies because he was in, he was trying to maintain himself as a scientist and to speak empirically. But he did um, proffer the idea that all is psyche, that the entirety of reality is psyche. And he explored this too in his conversations with physicists and much of that today is being talked about um, with physicists um, in the theories of, uh, of of what reality is at the quantum level. I won't go there, but I just wanted to mention that. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to just cover a few things quickly. Um, the Cooler Host, that poem, um, you mentioned um, that your sense of interpretation was Jung's sense of the other. I was, I was reminded simply of the self, of the unconscious, um, being that is more, yeah, being more dangerous than any external ghost. The fear there is is bringing forth what is within, and in that fear, um, it may be the fear that the container, our our consciousness, may not hold when confronting the uncontainable uh, mystery, something that is so vast and. Um, so beyond us that there is this fear and the and and there are moments in um, in the journey sometimes when the container breaks and there's a mental illness or an imbalance because it, it, it can't be held mm -hmm. for example if one were to identify with an archetype that's a very dangerous proposition mm -hmm. um, the living god if you will the confrontation with the living god about which it said in exodus no man sees my face and lives um, the, the encounter is such that the enormity of the deity or the self is such that we can't contain it. Imagine like uh, uh, a satellite around the sun. If it gets too close to the sun, it gets pulled in and, and becomes the sun in a sense, right? Anyway, that, and then <laughs> I just want to make a few points. I love those comments. Quickly. Thank you. I mean, go ahead. Keep a going. A few points quickly. Um, Love and hate. I I uh, wanted to respond to that part to just say that I see hate as really just another state of love, in the sense that ice is another state of water. Um, hate is like is like love's shout to reconcile against self denial and self destruction. It's the longing to reconnect. Like when your child says, I hate you, you know your child doesn't hate you. You know your child is expressing they hate the feeling of disconnection. They're, they're angered by, they're frustrated and angered by the fact that they can't connect. And this is the root of hatred, even for adults. It's, it's the need to reconnect and that the pain, the pain, the real, real pain of that disconnection. So I see... I see it as a whole thing that that hate is really just the other face of love and they're they're one thing. You know, who who hates and who who loves, you know, it's all it's all one thing. Um it's relational. Anyway, I'll I'll leave it there. I oh, said <laughs> I enjoyed very much this uh, uh enjoyed it. thank you. And I and I think it's a a difficult balance to try to bring those ghosts from the unconscious forward to the degree that we can handle it. And, and I think many times that's the role of therapy. To, it may also be yeah. the role of humanity. This, huh. is, this is the work we do. No, but I mean, someone that, uh, someone that can help us bring just the right amount forward, uh, Sensing how much we can handle. Yes. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Hey, if I may, I'd like to call on myself. And okay, uh, <laughs> please. I I live in Amherst, so I've been to the homestead and was went through a tour there and was really taken by kind of the daily life. Um, and her funeral, for example, in the house and how she her body was carried out. Um, but there's something I remember is that her wish was that this corpus of work would be destroyed. Is that right? And, and I wonder if you would remark on like the miracle of having this conversation at all, that this body of work is here for us to engage. Uh, thank you. Um, two things I'll say. There's, it's, it's a paradox. Mm. Now, um, it was what people did back then was they all they wrote a lot of letters. I mean, Emily was a prolific letter writer, and she saved all the letters that she received. People saved their letters back then, and and it was somewhat of a tradition that uh, after a burial, you went back to the home, and what you did was you you got the the letters that had been sent to the person who had died and you you ritualistic burnt the person's letters and so when they came back to the to the home at the at the um through the back door um to the homestead they immediately got uh, the bundle of, of emily's letters from her bedroom and they burnt all the letters we would give anything to have those letters so the letters of Emily Dickinson that we have were been collected from people she sent letters to. So we have uh, volumes of the letters that she sent, but we don't have any of the letters that people sent to her. They're all burnt. Now, what about, the, so that's about the letters. The poems supposedly, to begin with, nobody was aware that there was 1,800 poems. Her sister, Lavinia, knew that she wrote poetry. But she had no idea of the extent of the poetry. Now, um, so therefore, since it was never discussed that you know, I have all of I have this all of this volume, all these poems that I've written, they weren't found until after she died. So, because nobody knew about them, really, um, she couldn't have said that they that they were to be burned. And we have. Poems that she that Emily wrote about not wanting to be published, but at the same time, public is that publication is the auction of the mind. But um, there are other statements she made, particularly in letters, that suggest that she really felt the day would come that her poem, poetry would be immortal. So I think there was a part of her that might have hope that someday her poems would be published. Does that at least say something about your, your question? It does. Thank you. Darlene? And then I think this will be our last speaker before we close. And Hi, I'm Darlene. And I was surprised um, about a, a couple things tonight because I have followed Emily Dickinson and I was one of those persons who did a tour at her home also a couple months ago. They had an open house and, and celebrated her birthday at the cemetery and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've read some of her, her work as well. I think the two things that I was surprised about tonight was one that she had a late love because I've heard it depicted that she was in love with um, her sister-in-law, right? Um, and that a lot of uh, her letters, um, love letters, or passionate love letters were written to her. Um, the other one I was surprised about is that she attended Mount Holyoke College, the seminary. I'm a Mount Holyoke College student and a, an alum, and I've never heard that. So I don't know where I went to school at. Um, um, and then the other piece I thought of in your lecture was that they were soulmates because they believed in a higher power and it embraced their spiritual spirituality and divinity. But I think that in reality, they be repelled um, the patriarchal structure. 
I didn't see them as being um, invested as much in that and um, nurturing that. Um, because if you think about it back in that day, in the contextual frame, um, Christianity, religion, church was such an important piece, a large piece of that. Um, it was part of their daily life. And for them to have repelled that and not be a part and make that conscious choice of not being a part, um, I think is a, a much bigger sign of something. And I think that they were soulmates in that way. Um, you know, they were liberal, progressive in that way and were willing to make a stand. And their, their uh, alignment, so to speak, had to do more with that internal conflict and embracing their spirituality in a natural, more natural way, aligning with the universe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I totally agree with you. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the sister-in-law, there's been a lot written. Mm. Uh, you know, people have read the poems and said, oh, uh, this was to her sister-in-law. We don't know that. There were uh, one or two poems where she actually says the word Sue in the poems. But um, one thing, relationships between women at that time period were very different than they are today. And in other words, women would walk arm in arm down the street. And they had a lot of physical contact between women. Um, and the way they talked with each other, which we would read um, a message today and think that was some, some sort of um, inappropriate intimacy going on, where in fact it was just um, women talked differently to women, other women at that time period. Um, we will never know the answer to that. So um, exactly, th there was certainly a time when they were very close friends. I certainly think that that she loved Sue. And and um, when Emily died, when Emily died, and she and Sue had not uh, had much to do with each other for years. Uh, but when she died, uh, Sue came over to the house and she said, uh, uh, see the, the people who loved you prepared your body for a funeral. Gave you, you know, washed the body, etc. And and Sue came and she said, "This is for me to do. Hmm. I, I'm the one that's the closest to." Thank you, Kay. Well, there's certainly an emotional closeness. Thank you, people. I really enjoyed being with you. Thanks for being. Thank you. On behalf of the Young Association, I want to thank you, Kay. I certainly learned more about Emily and Young tonight. And um, on behalf of the audience, I know we all appreciate your sharing and scholarship and willingness to give us this talk. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Yeah. Good. I'll bid you good night. Okay. Good night. Folks, you're, you're welcome to stay a little longer if anyone would like to speak about anything or has any comments that they'd like to. I think raising the hand is the best way to do it once again. Does anyone wish to express something? Christine. Uh, yeah. Um, am I unmuted? I can't tell here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was kind of blown away by the the poem about, um, you know, self-reflection. Is that hard or that scary? And I don't know. She didn't read the end of that. The last stanza on that on that poem is um, it's uh, the prudent carries a revolver. He bolts the door or looking a superior specter more near. I mean, it's pretty, she's just saying, it, it makes me so curious what her own uh, inner, um, like meeting with her own inner self was 
how how she could come to write that poem. Obviously, she had had some kind of experience of of the challenge of looking deeply into oneself. I guess. Anyway, that's just a comment. There, there was something, yeah, in that poem about the, the fear of the shadow, the darkness. She, she, in the in the lines just before the ones you you read, our self behind our self concealed should startle most assassin hid in our apartment be horrors least um she so she sees this she sees it as the assassin hidden in our apartment but maybe she's also confronting death um and the dark the dark side of the shadow in this poem interesting anyone else comments well Carol? Yeah, I mean, just on that point, though, it might be like, if I'm thinking, might be like Jung's struggle, like when he, as a child, when he first thought of having a big turd on the golden, you know, thing of the church, you know, it was horrifying to him, horrifying that he would have such thoughts. And again, I'm wondering, uh, doubly so in terms of her time uh what she found her she had to go inside and and hear herself she had to listen to herself and i think what she heard what she dreamed could have been very terrifying i don't i mean cause conflict cause anxiety anxiety and uh but anyway just in terms of all of that, where she would have the freedom to be able to think, feel, express in her poetry what she does. How did she find that freedom to do that? You know. So anyway, that's one of my thoughts. What gives us the freedom? Takes any of us to go really go inside. There's something about the genius quality of Jung and and Dickinson that I it's a mystery <laughs> this human capacity of, of real genius I wonder if it's if it speaks to what you're saying Carol yes I kept thinking of the word limitless possibility I know that's a but the again around genius but the capacity to really tolerate and perceive if that limitless possibility uh not even judgment you know what it means as a therapist often whereas not to judge someone uh, but to let them go where they need to go i mean you know again all the moral judgments of culture against having two wives or multiple you know you know, all these things. What what gives us the freedom to go beyond what our, you know, culture will tolerate or what over the centuries things have been tolerated. So uh but any but but that Jung and Dickinson had to go there. And they have, but it's a capacity they had, like a genius capacity. It's a capacity they had to feel these things and think them. It's quite something. Yeah. I thought her presentation was pretty astonishing. I, I like, like what, what just hit me kind of feeling. Um, even from the analysis of Groundhog's Day. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like that. That was quite a start. Uh, it was very like gentle and even casual feeling. But when she got to the place where the groundhog sees his shadow and then goes back into <laughs> the dwelling to ruminate, like that's a whole thing right there. Yeah, and it and it mapped onto my experience in a way. Like I've I've had like the fright of seeing my shadow. Um. Mm. kind of the wherever I am, wherever I go there I am kind of feeling 
Um, so, yeah, that was that was remarkable. Mm. Can you say any more about the the you you said how much you identified with going back into the home? Right. Um, well, one of the things Christine is like she she was very uh, aware of like the the present material, the materiality of February second, her location in Pennsylvania, that icon in the american mythology and and then went deep with it in a way so yeah what i um what i'm learning to do is uh attend to my shadow self and yeah ruminate with it i didn't read it so much as a fear as 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 doing more work is how I sense that uh, more time, more a longer winter. Yeah, Elena D Denny, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you have your hand up. Hello, um, I just wanted to make a comment. If wondering if anyone else had this concept of the brain poem, the brain as the sky, thinking about the sky holds the sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds. It, it, it doesn't judge. It just holds all of that. It, it holds everything. And, and um, maybe the I was wondering if Emily Dickinson sort of had that idea of consciousness is there, but it's how we judge it, how we make it, how we perceive it, that it's it's not really not like the sky because the sky doesn't judge. I don't know. I just, I just thought that I would bring that up as... Mm -hmm. I thought that line was very, very powerful, and just thinking about what what she could have meant by that. Mm -hmm. I love that poem. the The brain is wider than the sky. In other brain words, is, is why for me it means the human mind can encompass the entirety. It, it's it's kind of it's a remarkable statement. It's, it's 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 kind of the inverse of how we usually think about it. Like we're inside the cosmos, and she's saying no, the cosmos is inside the brain, right? Because we can conceive of it. To me, that's the most astonishing thing about that poem. Anyway, yeah, all right. It, it, it resonates a great deal with um, with some of the physics theoreticians that are working today. Just the concept that consciousness itself is what permeates the universe. It is what is. Um, we're getting very close in some physics theories to the idea that, um, you know, we have gravity and other of these large powers in, in the universe, that consciousness itself may be one of them. Um, that's something that's being explored. There hasn't been an experiment made yet that will prove it, but it's an interesting idea. <laughs> Okay. once it's proven we'll come back to emily and say oh yeah she said it in just a few words <laughs> well of course a lot of people have said it it's an ancient idea it's not unique to uh to anyone really yeah. <laughs> well it just speaks of her geniusness yes What are you knitting? What? Oh, beautiful! Yeah, it's a it's a blanket, but what's from my my sofa? Oh, I love it. It was a cold winter. By the time I finish it, it'll be for next winter. <laughs> but it's just to snuggle with. 
Thank you. Um, I, I like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was going to just, I was going to ask Danny if he had a thought. He looked thoughtful there for a minute, but <laughs> maybe Carol wanted to say something. Oh, whoever. <laughs> no, I wasn't, I mean, I could say a lot, but I um, was actually thinking of logging off and saying good night, but um you know, also, yeah, there's just so much here. It's it's kind of it it pr pushes my limits on how to respond. Um, you know, the idea in that poem um, that the mind contains the sky or the sky contains the mind and is something that I've pondered. I mean, just as in terms of beauty and um, you know, seeing things in nature that really strike something that's heartfelt and. Uh, having a bigger perception of things in the natural world. And, and that it's, it's, I've come to see that it's something that I both identify on the outside of me. That's true within me. And I would say that's true of all of us is that we see beauty um, because it's within us, not because it's external, but because we identify with what we're experiencing. And, and so that's kind of how I take her poem um, in that regard is that, that within us is everything. Um, you know, I was thinking there was a, a thought came to me is that that as a culture, as a species, we've become disassociated from our creator, that we live in a in sort of an insanity, a disassociation from from this wonderful thing that we live in. Um, and so we find these little tidbits and we we want to capture them. We want to take pictures of the sunset. We want to take pictures of rainbows, but really those things are within us. And, uh, and so I really, I really appreciated that just at the point at the time that she was like understanding this truth about herself to be able to write this poetry is kind of a, a phenomena that she was, I don't know what influenced her. Her father was a lawyer. Like where did she get the, the little seedling that she decided to grow uh, such amazing insights. Um, so that's all. From God, right? From God. Well, and so that's Her true. Poem, this little, little gift, this gift from God is me. Yeah. Do you ever feel that? Just curious that yeah. you, that you are given something that is totally you. You already have it, have it. Hmm. Yeah, no, you can I move that. towards it in the world you're born into, your authentic self. But, or, I mean, but you had it. I don't know if you ever feel that. I do. Yeah, no, I do. So, could yeah. I say quickly? Um, one of the things that resonated with me with the um, lecture of the talk was a piece about the brain being a transformer. And, um, you know, I think uh, that piece of transcendentalism and the impact that that perhaps had um, on Emily Dickinson and on Jung, um, because really um, that focus and that emphasis really is about the body being a vessel, right? Um, and being able to, being in tune to the spirituality that, occurs around us right mm. and, and those greater spirits and so um that piece resonated with me quite a bit mm. so i enjoyed the lecture and i want to thank everybody for um providing me with the opportunity to attend or participate i'm back <laughs> uh, glad you were here darlene and everyone elena and yeah i think we have to wrap up yes. <laughs> good night everybody Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good to see you. Here with you. <laughs>